On the edge of London's Hampstead Heath lives a scientist with a theory that challenges science's most fashionable area of research, genetics and DNA. Rupert Sheldrake has a double first degree and a PhD in biochemistry, but he's been accused of conducting a perverse personal crusade against orthodox science. We have effectively in science a one-party system with a deep commitment to a particular faith. There's been a concerted attempt to explain the secret of life in terms of DNA, to treat the genes as explaining everything. But in fact, there are so many unsolved problems in biology. The problem is that genes don't explain how forms develop, how instincts develop. So the genes are not an adequate explanation of life. And therefore, I'm trying to produce a new model about the way life is and this hypothesis makes some people extremely angry. I've been characterized as a rebel, as a heretic, as a mischief maker, as a troublemaker, perhaps as being even rather mad. All right, boy, let's hold hands. Sheldrake is a deeply committed Christian and that's fueled a suspicion that his scientific judgment has been clouded by his religious beliefs. But for Sheldrake, science itself has become a religion, with a set of doctrines he can no longer accept. Most scientists, and indeed I myself, have been taught to look at animals, plants and people as being entirely purposeless, living organisms as having originated purely by chance, lacking any meaning, any value, simply there as inanimate automatic mechanisms that can be explained in terms of ordinary physics and chemistry. Many people within science have become very wedded to this machine model, the mechanistic model. And indeed, for some people, it's become almost a kind of religion. And therefore, they experience any questioning of this model uh, as an attack on their most fundamental acts of faith. Cambridge University's prestigious Department of Biochemistry that Sheldrake took his degree and stayed on as a postgraduate. He remembers it as where the high priesthood of the biological sciences initiated him into what he saw as their strange rituals. At Cambridge I began to feel a sense of discomfort. I was interested in the nature of life and the first thing you did was to kill whatever it was that you were studying. As soon as you grind plants up to look at how they work, you lose precisely that essence of what life is. So I became aware that there was a great gulf between the kind of science I was being taught and my own experience of living things, which is why I'd gone into biology in the first place. For as long as I can remember, I was very, very interested in plants and animals. I kept pets of various kinds. I collected plants. And my father was an amateur natural historian who encouraged all this. But there was one particular event which had a big impact on me. I was a child, I suppose about five, and I saw a fence of willow stakes, and the stakes came to life. This seemingly dead piece of matter, this just this piece of wood, had turned into a living thing, it had regenerated, it had come to life. And this sense of the regenerative power of life obviously made a strong impression, although I don't think I thought about it. Um, for many, many years afterwards, when I did finally remember this incident, I saw what an extraordinary 
impact it must have had. For I spent years at Cambridge working on the rooting of cuttings, the regeneration of pieces of stem, the way that plants regenerate after damage and wounding. And I spent years working on the development of form. This is one of the holistic questions in biology. How do plants have their form? And in my postdoctoral work, when I was a research fellow of the Royal Society, I went on working on plant form and how it comes into being. But the more I worked on it, the more I became convinced that this reductionistic analytical um, method will never get to the root of the problem. If you don't work on the development of organisms, you can easily get the impression that it's all understood in terms of DNA and genetic material and various biochemical reactions. Many biologists talk about DNA as if it's some kind of magical, intelligent entity. The trouble is that DNA is only a chemical, and it helps to understand the chemical inheritance of organisms. But how they make their forms, how they make their shapes, we don't know. It's not just the DNA, there's something else shaping it, a pattern of influences of an unknown nature, assumed to be chemical and physical, um, but essentially we don't know. On one thing at least, scientists agree with Sheldrake, that the development of form morphogenesis is a mystery. But they say, ultimately, it must one day be explained by DNA. But for Sheldrake, by now a young Cambridge fellow, that was merely an act of faith. Alone among his colleagues, he felt sure a new theory was needed. I realized there was a big puzzle about morphogenesis. There was a, some fundamental problem that, if you look at plants, the DNA in the petals and in the other flower structures and in the leaves and in the roots is the same. So you can't explain the different forms of the leaves and the shoots and the roots just in terms of the DNA, because they're genetically programmed identically. Something else must make these structures different. I then discovered, to my amazement, that in the 1920s, some of the great figures in biology, like C.H. Waddington, the British biologist, had proposed that there was a kind of field, a new kind of field, involved in living organisms called the morphogenetic field, the form-shaping field and that these fields shaped the way organisms developed, like an invisible mold. But the people who proposed these fields, they were attacked on the grounds that they were involving some mystical force that was not part of ordinary physics. But it seemed to me a fascinating and essential insight. It made sense. The trouble is that it left unexplained the nature of the fields themselves. So the key insight that came to me was that morphogenetic fields have a kind of memory to do with the resonance of things according to their form or pattern. Now this was the Eureka moment, the idea there's a kind of memory involved in life and that it's transmitted from past organisms to present organisms by a process that I called morphic resonance, the idea of like influencing like through space and time. Sheldrake's theory was that all living things have morphic fields that are like living blueprints of their species. Sheldrake said they were akin to magnetic fields created by every member of the species and guiding the growth of subsequent generations. Once he got hold of the theory, he looked for other mysteries that the fields might explain. I then realized that instincts, the way that animals behave, were also great unsolved problems in biology. And this hypothesis could also apply in those realms as well. Like a bird making its nest, for example. Uh, this is an instinctive pattern of behavior. It doesn't have to watch other birds build the nest first. And so the idea was that the behavior of the nervous system could be shaped or molded by these morphic fields. 
they could help to explain, for example, how little ducks learn to swim. As soon as they hatch out of the egg, they can get straight into water and they can swim straight away. The behavior, for example, of termites, the way that individual insects work together to build these fantastic termite colonies, turns out to be profoundly mysterious. And the idea there would be that there's a morphic field for the whole colony. And the same would apply to flocks of birds, where a whole flock can turn almost at the same time. Or schools of fish, where even in darkness, the school of fish can turn corners very quickly without bumping into each other. These, again, are not understood. And it's only if you have the idea of an overall field that it makes sense. When I first thought of these ideas, I could see that to pursue these would mean going beyond the pale of conventional science. And when I discussed it with friends, uh, some of them told me that I should definitely not publish these ideas or even talk about them, that I should continue along the straight and narrow path, which would lead me to a professorship and perhaps to a fellowship at the Royal Society and that kind of thing. Um, and then if I really was still interested in these things, when I retired, perhaps write a short monograph about them. This was the advice that was given to me. Um, and this is the advice that many scientists follow. It's amazing how many scientists, when they've got Nobel Prizes, or when they've retired, or when they've got FRSs, or when they've got all three together, um, start putting forward uh, rather unconventional views. And it turns out they've held these views for years, but have never dared to say them. Well, I think science is about exploring new ways of looking, not to have areas of debate suppressed by just fear. So I preferred to take the very risky course of publishing my book and pursuing this line of research, realizing that this would involve striking out on my own. But I preferred to do this, to staying within the institutional framework, paying lip service to an orthodoxy in which I no longer believed. Um, I suppose people had the same choice in Russia under Brezhnev. I mean, did you pretend that you were a good communist? And, or did you become a dissident and risk uh, all that that implied? Well, I thought that I'd rather be a dissident. His immodestly titled book, A New Science of Life, was the result. It was sent for review to the journal Nature, widely regarded as the world's most influential science magazine. The book was read by Nature's editor-in-chief, John Maddox, who denounced it in a dramatic editorial. And in terms that echoed the medieval church's condemnation of religious heretics. I was so offended by it that I said that while it's wrong that books should be burned, uh, in practice, if book burning were allowed, this book would be a candidate. I think it's dangerous that people should be allowed by our liberal societies to put that kind of nonsense into currency. It's unnecessary uh, to introduce magic into the explanation of um, uh, physical and biological phenomena when in fact uh, there's every likelihood that the continuation of research as it's now practiced will indeed fill all the gaps that Sheldrake draws attention to. You see, Sheldrake's is not a scientific theory. Sheldrake uh, is putting forward magic instead of science. And um, that can be condemned in exactly the language that the popes used to condemn Galileo. And um, uh, for the same reasons, it is heresy. Others question Sheldrake's real motives. I think it's an interesting sociological question as to why someone who is a perfectly respectable plant physiologist should um, suddenly move in this very strange direction. Um, and I think you're going to have to look for those reasons, both in terms of a person's individual psychology, in Sheldrake's case, undoubtedly his religious beliefs, um, but also in... Um, 
if I'm savage about it, I would say that, um, after all, all of us who are working in science want to see some sort of personal recognition, want to see some sort of fame, and it's actually an extremely cheap way to get notoriety in the media and, um, and, 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 and popular support if you suddenly jump up and start attacking, um, if you like, scientific orthodoxy in this sort of way. Sheldrake's ideas are just nonsense, wrote Professor Lewis Walpert, one of many biologists who won't dignify Sheldrake's theory by talking about it. But at Cambridge, a very few people did listen to Sheldrake. One, the psychologist Nicholas Humphrey. But it's also, isn't it, the part of the attraction of the theory is that it applies to people, so that when somebody... Humphrey was intrigued by Sheldrake's theory, because if plants and animals had morphic fields, then so should people. Was it those things which Humphrey proposed some human tests of the theory, as much as anything to counter the general reaction to Sheldrake. Rupert certainly evoked extraordinary hostility from mainstream scientists of a kind which I personally find both distasteful and actually surprising. I'm ashamed of the kind of reactions which, uh, which Rupert uh, gets. I've actually got friends who refuse to be in the same room with him. And when people react like that to somebody who's all they're doing is putting forward ideas which may be seen as crazy, but at least they're, they're, they're interesting ideas, they're fun to play with, they're, they're, they're exciting original ideas. Um, I think that that in itself is enough to make someone like myself or, or someone like Professor Bateson, for example, actually want to back Rupert up and to some extent to help him too. Like Humphrey, Patrick Bateson, provost of Kings, already knew Sheldrake. I find Rupert a very interesting man. And he's a very clever man too. And when he comes up with an idea which I find wildly counterintuitive, of course, the first uh, reaction is to reject it. Uh, but then, because so much of biology is uh, unexpected, I mean, so many things we discover we hadn't expected, there's always a thought that maybe he's got something and it would be worthwhile trying to find out whether or not he's right. In America, Sheldrake found himself attracting disciples from the New Age movement. Morphic resonance appealed to their mystical philosophy of life, which they saw Sheldrake, a scientist, appearing to endorse. And a few scientists would listen to him, mainly on the continent. The, the main physical analogy for this behavior in biology is provided by fields. Sheldrake's reason was that they were less bothered by heretical ideas. On the continent, especially in Germany and in Holland, the scientific community seems more open-minded, also more philosophically sophisticated. They're more aware that the conventional views in science are only theories. On the other hand, um, in Britain, I'm very often invited by student science societies to give talks in universities. But some members of the department have created such a fuss um, saying that this shouldn't be allowed, students shouldn't be allowed to hear this kind of thing, that they've actually vetoed these invitations and had them withdrawn. Stung by the hostility from his peers and emboldened by his success abroad, Sheldrake has gone on the offensive, attacking yet more sacred scientific beliefs. One of his targets is the prevailing theory of evolution, which he goes so far as to call quasi-religious propaganda based on modern genetics and a deliberate misreading of Darwin. What we have to account for is the incredible variety of living things. And the standard view taught in schools today is that all this happened by accident. Now, this is a, an extraordinary view. There's no purpose in evolution. There's no real creativity anywhere just blind chance combined with natural selection and this is held with the strength of religious fervor um, that it's hard to credit sometimes how much people want to believe this or need to believe it um, as the ultimate truth about life in fact it leaves a lot of questions about uh, life unanswered Got Sheldrake believes in an older but now derided theory of evolution called the inheritance of acquired characteristics, which says that giraffes, for example, got long necks through reaching up and then passing on that acquired extra length to their offspring. They've got long necks because they get up so much. That's right. The inheritance of acquired characteristics is one of the big heresies in biology. 
and is something that most biologists feel is uh, something that has to be kept at bay, stamped out uh, whenever it rears its ugly head. Um, yet Darwin himself believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. But the history of biology has been rewritten to exclude that feature of Darwin's thought in favor of the neo-Darwinian orthodoxy of the inheritance of DNA. So oddly enough, the biggest heretic in the history of biology is Darwin himself, who very strongly believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. The camel is Sheldrake's favorite illustration of his own theory of evolution. Camels like to kneel down, and they are born with protective knee pads. Modern science teaches that the pads arose by chance and developed through natural selection. But Sheldrake's explanation manages to combine two heresies, the old one and his own brand new one of morphic resonance. The inheritance of acquired characteristics fits extraordinarily well with the idea of morphic resonance. According to morphic resonance, camels acquire pads on their knees when they're embryos through a resonant transmission from past camels of developing pads on their knees through kneeling down through a kind of species memory. So what I'm trying to do is not destroy science or undermine reason, but rather um, to find ways of looking rationally and scientifically at some of the fundamental assumptions of science as we now know it, and to find out by experiment whether these assumptions are valid or not, and whether science could move in a new direction. But Sheldrake's shifting focus, he's begun to search out more areas in which to challenge accepted wisdom. Blooded by his battles with orthodox science, he's now inciting his lay readership to take up arms against the enemy. The once mild heretic has become the subversive. What I've put out is a book called Seven Experiments That Could Change the World, a do-it-yourself guide to revolutionary science, in which I outline seven simple experiments which could revolutionize our view of nature and which could be done by anyone who is sufficiently interested. And um, I'm confident that there could be a new era in which science could be liberated from the restrictions imposed by institutional conformity um, and a new, a new fresh period of exploration could, could take place which would regenerate science from the grassroots up.